I'm Rod Giltaka. I'm the CEO of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. The Canadian government is banning guns. But did they base their decision on real evidence? Or is the truth a lot different than Canadians think? We're about to find out. Good evening. One of the underpinnings of the sweeping May 1st, 2020 gun ban is the government's declaration that it's really about increasing the safety of Canadians. But as with anything, we should ask ourselves, is that really true? The most notable spokesperson for the May 1st gun ban is Bill Blair, the Minister of Public Safety. These tragic moments when innocent women, worshippers, police officers, and innocent Canadians across the country have been killed by evil people wielding powerful guns. For decades, chiefs of police, advocacy groups, grieving families, and everyday Canadians have been calling for a ban of these types of firearms, guns that were designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers, and not for recreational purposes. Guns that belong on a battlefield, and not on our streets. Guns that were designed to kill people. They were intended in their purpose to kill people, and they have been used in Canada to kill innocent people. And for decades, Canadians have been calling upon successive governments for reform, for stronger gun control. And we have listened. And today we are taking action. Now, if you are interested in public safety, you'd want to look at the factors that occur that most negatively impact public safety. Once you've identified them, you can begin figuring out how to eliminate them. And in our case, reduce firearm related violence. When it comes to death related to firearms, here's what we're up against. In Canada, Roughly 1,100 people die as a result of injuries sustained by a firearm, depending on the year. Between 70 and 80% of those deaths are suicides. That's roughly 800 people. The next leading cause is homicide at around 140 to 200 Canadians per year, again, depending on the year. This is followed by officer-involved shootings at somewhere around 30 to 35, and firearm-related accidents averaging about 9 to 11 per year. So clearly, the two major concerns here are firearm-related homicide and suicide. Those two issues represent 90% of firearm-related death in Canada. When it comes to firearm-related homicide and public shootings, these situations are overwhelmingly the result of gang activity and or other activity primarily involving the drug trade, human trafficking, and other criminal enterprises. Before politics, I was uh, a member of the Medicine Not Police Service for 35 years. I retired from policing in uh, December 23rd, 2015, and got into politics April of 16. So I had three and a half months of retirement. When Trudeau marched out and spouted off that we are going to eliminate the firearms that are designed to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time, that was fear-mongering. A gun ban that focused its attention on law-abiding firearm owners who are not the criminal element in our communities, in our society at all, uh, is a misguided approach to solve the issue of public safety. There is no evidence to support what they've done will do anything to public safety. I'm a 23-year RCMP member, but I spent a significant amount of time working on cross-border weapons smuggling. Canada enjoys a very uh, safe society. We sit at seventh in the world ranking of uh, privately owned firearms. So the proliferation of firearms in legal hands in Canada is significant. We also sit very low on the homicide rate by firearm. We're 129th. I mean, we fall far below countries like Luxembourg, and Belgium. What we really need to focus on is the problem, which is criminality and illegal crime use of firearms. The gang problem, in 2018, Statistics Canada shows there were approximately 651 homicides in Canada. Only 38% were committed by firearm. And of those 38%, 54% were directly gang related. So if we look at the lion's share of the problem, what we have is a guns and gangs problem. The availability and proliferation of firearms purchased in the United States, imported and smuggled illegally into Canada, are the guns that are falling into the hands of criminal gangs. And the majority of crime guns being used predominantly in the Lower Mainland, in Toronto, Montreal, are handguns. This gun ban focuses on mostly rifles. 
taking a particular type of firearm that wasn't readily available to those uh, that were, were in criminal activity isn't going to stop criminal activity. Those guns are not being seized at crime scenes. Those guns are not showing up in gang warfare. Those guns are not the type of firearms that are being used. What we have is a handgun problem in, in, in the hands of criminal gangs. What's concerning about this whole process is the government is trying to send the message that this is about public safety. We have a problem with violence on our streets, absolutely. Driven by gangs, driven by drugs, driven by turf wars, driven by profits. The sheer vastness of our country and the length of the Canada-US border, if we're going to be successful, then we need to see proper interagency integration. So on this side of the border, we need to see a good integration between the RCMP, Canada Border Services, and the municipal and provincial police forces and their weapons enforcement and uh, ground level intelligence. But from a legislative perspective, we have to ensure that our lawmakers are holding crown prosecutors, judges, and the correctional system to account for their role and responsibility in public safety. And that means that a person arrested with an illegal gun that has no firearms license, it should be a no brain, no question, simple, you break the law, you're held responsible, you've made that decision. The type of fund that's being earmarked for a potential buyback um, and prohibition and ban on legally owned firearms is money that could be directly applied to law enforcement personnel and funding for direct firearms enforcement operations. We do not nationally, federally, or in any province under the RCP have a dedicated weapons enforcement operational unit. We have different support sections that help provide information and, and administrative support to ongoing investigations, but we do not have a dedicated or integrated uh, weapons enforcement team. There's no evidence to support that this will have anything to do with public safety. So let's take the resources that we're going to use to, to try and confiscate firearms from people who are law-abiding, and let's focus on those who choose not to follow the law. Let's focus on those who are you know, acquiring their firearms illegally through the United States. Let's prevent people from getting involved in this activity in the first place through, through crime prevention initiatives. If you're going to apply something in the name of public safety, then let's make sure that it's a fact-based, statistically driven, sound initiative that we know will bring an outcome of public, greater public safety. We should be able to trust our government. This particular liberal Trudeau government have, have demonstrated that they can't be trusted. Period. So Canada's already low firearm-related homicide numbers could be cut in half by dealing with Canada's growing gang problems. So the question now is, what exactly is the government doing about all this violence? And what does any of it have to do with the gun ban? We'll find out when we come back. The current Liberal government maintains that the reason they intend to confiscate hundreds of thousands of firearms from Canadians is that it will improve public safety. But yet we clearly see that the biggest impact on increasing safety would be to deal with gangs and other criminal enterprises. This is all pretty obvious. So what has the government done to keep Canadians safe? Well, let's meet someone who is trying to do something about gang violence. Former gang leader and now the founder and president of the One by One movement, Marcel Wilson. I left home from a very early age. Uh, I was homeless at the age of like 13. You know, I was out in the streets looking for a, sort of a place to belong. And I had bumped into a group of like-minded individuals that were in uh, similar situations. It morphed into an urban street gang and then graduated to more organized crime. I grew up where in my culture, the hip hop culture, whatever you want to call it, guns were extremely prevalent. It, it was a sign of power, it was a sign of respect. Um, so I remember having a strong attraction to the gun because of what it represented in my particular communities. The gangbangers that I know or the people, even from my past life, we didn't carry legal, legal firearms. They definitely come from south of the border, and in some cases through indigenous reserves. Uh, that's been going on for quite a while. The majority of the shootings that we're seeing like on a daily basis here, I'm willing to bet that 
the majority of those guns are not legally sourced. The one by one movement launched during a time that there was a gang war going on with another known neighborhood. Um, we had come in to develop programming specific to the area, um, specific to each individual community member's needs. Our communities are hungry for change. Um, they're hungry for help. People are asking us to bring services, bring recreation centers, bring programs, whatever we can to service the communities. We should be focused on root cause issues and we should be focused on illegal firearms getting into this country opposed to dealing with any kind of um, legal, legal weapons or firearms, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. The notion that banning any legal firearm in Canada, that it's going to lessen the street violence, the extreme acts of violence that we're seeing with guns, is absolutely offensive and it's absolutely ridiculous. None of the guns that they are trying to ban or any type of legal ban was going to affect our communities directly. It also takes away much needed funding. I can guarantee you we would have used that money in a much more productive way that would have lessened the gun violence that we're seeing in our city right now. I've been using my personal money to do this. It's my company, it's my baby. You know, we've had a lot of generous people help us out. It's not always financial, sometimes it's in kind. People volunteering their time. But we're not even at a tenth of the capacity that we should be. We need the government's help, we need all three levels of government, we need the private sector, we need everyone we can to help us because we're, we're struggling. For us, it's in the name, the one by one movement. Even if we can save just one, then I feel like I've done my job. In Canada's epicenter of gun violence, the GTA or Greater Toronto Area, the government has done little, and some might argue next to nothing, to deal with these issues. Some sources say that the May 1st gun ban will cost taxpayers over a billion dollars. This is a reasonable figure, especially when you consider the now ended long gun registry was supposed to cost taxpayers $2 million, but ended up costing $2 billion. But billions in wasted tax dollars aside, the Liberals did make a promise to spend $327 million on a national guns and gangs initiative. Here's more from the current Liberal government promising the funding. This is the latest step in our initiative to take action against gun and gang violence, which I announced about this time last year. That announcement included major new funding of $327.6 million over five years, and that will ramp up to $100 million annually thereafter. Throughout the year, we've also delivered support to crime prevention and intervention programs in communities across the country through the National Crime Prevention Strategy, helping steer people away from the criminal world Five years later, Member of Parliament Glenn Motts filed an order paper question asking how much of the $327 million guns and gangs budget has been allocated and where. As it turns out, the Liberal government had distributed absolutely nothing from when they were elected in 2015 all the way to 2018, even though they were the ones sounding the alarm about runaway gun violence. Funding agreement to distribute the money to the provinces were just completed in the summer of 2019. As of 2020, we don't know if that money has even been transferred yet. So if there was an epidemic of violence raging in Canada since before 2015, why would the government not address it in the area that would make the most sense? And why make taking legal guns away from licensed Canadians a priority? The more you look at the situation, the less credible their story seems to be. There's a lot more to cover on this topic, but we need to move on. When we come back, We'll talk about the leading cause of farms related mortality in Canada and what the government is or isn't doing about it.
Despite the spectacular nature of shootings in downtown centers across Canada, suicides represent roughly 75% of fire-related deaths. This equates to somewhere between 500 and 800 Canadians per year using firearms to take their own lives. And it's reasonable to think this is a lot of people, and it is. But how many suicides are there in Canada per year altogether? The answer is, depending on the year, over 4,000. Firearms are the method used in roughly 14 to 16% of suicide, literally a fraction of the time. But even so, is the Liberal government doing anything to reduce suicide other than banning guns from millions of Canadians? Someone who is trying to make a difference is Kathleen Finley, founder of the 988 Campaign for Canada, as well as the CEO for the Centre for Patient Protection. She's been advocating for the introduction of a simplified three-digit number to access the National Suicide Hotline for those in immediate need. When a person is facing a mental health crisis or they're in great emotional distress, their ability to think clearly as they normally would is it's just not there. Both Canada and the United States have national suicide prevention hotlines. And in their day, they were game changers, really, in getting help to people who were in crisis situations. Um, earlier this summer, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission regulator in the United States, unanimously approved going forward with 988 in the United States. So they will be implementing this and rolling it out um, within the next two years. I thought, why not do this in Canada? I reached out to MPs and senators, and I was really quite amazed that all I got was silence on the other end. And I have always said that silence is not the right response when suicide is the subject. It would be really helpful just to get the buy-in um, of you know, cabinet ministers, senators, political movers and shakers who could build the momentum of support behind it, and to give families who are really looking for something that will help other people in situations like they have faced in the past. With 988, it's easy to remember, very much like 911 is. It's just 988 for mental health emergencies. We know that getting help to people very quickly uh, can mean the difference between life, literally, life and death in these situations. While simple and inexpensive solutions to reduce all suicides by all methods are being ignored, the current Liberal government, aided by a group of medical professionals of all people, launched a billion dollar gun ban. Even now, with the current Liberal government throwing billions of dollars in every direction, Crisis Services Canada's chat support service is unavailable, even during a global pandemic, nor is service in French available. What would a million dollars or five million dollars do to help suicide support? So it seems even simple things that we could be doing that would make a dramatic difference in both firearm-related homicide and firearm-related suicide are being ignored. But very little has actually been done on those fronts. The key to helping those that need it is to make evidence-based policies and effective funding decisions. Politics has no place in social services or Canadian emergency rooms. When we come back, we will have a look at the real costs of the government's May 1st gun ban. So stay with us. When it comes to suicide and homicide with firearms, there are far more effective things that we can do as a society that don't involve taking property away from hundreds of thousands of responsible people. People who have done nothing but comply with the law. To make matters worse, precious funding, especially in times like these, shouldn't be wasted on political grandstanding. Governments have a rich history of presenting unrealistic cost projections for anything they intend to do. This is never more true than when the goal is almost completely political. A prime example is a long gun registry from the early 2000s. The government claimed that the registry was critical to public safety and that it was going to save lives. The Liberal Party majority at the time told Canadians that the program would cost $2 million. Within a few years, the first phases of the program 
had ballooned to a billion dollars. Then, Auditor General Sheila Fraser condemned the Liberal government for intentionally misleading Parliament to hide the massive cost overruns. She said in December 2002, the issue here is not gun control, and it's not even astronomical cost overruns. What's really inexcusable is Parliament was in the dark. In the end, the long gun registry cost Canadians somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 billion. To make matters worse, a superior court decision was handed down in the Barbara Schiffler Commemorative Clinic versus Canada in 2014 that determined the long gun registry did not demonstrate a benefit to public safety. The Fraser Institute conservatively estimates the cost of a gun buyback at beyond a billion dollars. What and how many programs could be funded to make Canadian society better for everybody with a billion dollars of new spending? The more investigation we do into the government's actions on Bill C-71 and the May 1st gun ban, the more it looks like a terrible decision for everybody. Next time on Gun Ban Canada Exposed, no one wants criminals or dangerous people having easy access to firearms. We'll look at the crime guns in Canada, where they come from, what's actually true, and what isn't. You may be surprised. We'll see you then, and good night. Uh, what's at stake here is lives, Canadian lives. Your children's lives are at stake, and our children's lives are at stake. If you're going to apply something in the name of public safety, then let's make sure that it's a fact-based, statistically driven, sound initiative that we know will bring an outcome of public, greater public safety. 988, there are three simple numbers that could make all the difference uh, in saving lives.